Hey YouTube, it's Josh Mom with Magnolia Arms here, and today I've invited Jason Belzer into my house to do a little bit of an interview. Jason, how long have you been playing Hero Clicks? Well, oh gosh, since like uh, almost the inception, my, my parents got me a, a little starter set for Infinity Challenge. That was that was the first set that came out, and uh, <laughs> I. Uh, I started playing after that. I started getting a couple friends together. I started, because I helped with kids at youth group, I started getting some kids interested in it. And I didn't have a, a comic store or anything, a game store or anything to go to to play yet. Mm. But uh, I eventually found one and started uh, judging there, running tournaments there. That's nice. Now, I understand you just came back from a trip to Africa, did you not? <clears throat> No, but that would be you, and you can talk about oh, that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that the name of your YouTube? Magnolia no. Arms, yes. Okay. Would, would, would you like to? I, I'm here to interview <laughs> Josh Mon. <laughs> um, uh, what's your, your YouTube page about? What's that? Um, so Magnolia Arms is where I do a lot of discussions on... Um, antique bladed implements, in particular uh, African tribe-specific uh, bladed. This guy knows a lot about blades. <laughs> stuff. Um, I deal a lot with Congolese uh, swords of it's the disturbing. 1800s. Um, yeah. I, I discuss a little bit of just archaeological theories and a couple different um, popular opinions on these swords and my stances on them. It's a it's a slowly growing channel. I post videos whenever I have free time, which isn't as often as I would like. Archaeological theory. That sounds quite interesting. It's it sounds a lot uh, a lot more scholarly than it is. Um, mostly, it has to do with the fact that a lot of um, a lot of museums get really lazy when they label different bladed implements. Oh, and They'll, their whole That's family. It's it, it like their job. <laughs> it's their one job. And there are whole families of African blades that are mislabeled and just like abandoned. A lot of archaeologists simply, uh, if they don't understand what a blade is for, they simply add the word throwing to its title. This is a throwing knife, when it's clearly not. Huh. Another fun word is implement. If you see the word implement, that means that no one has any idea what it is. So, like, instead of the word knife, it says implement. Right. Or like, 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 like they don't even know if it was a knife. Right. So, like, in a lot of museums, um, you can find, especially in like the Stone Age sections, um, something that long, long, long time ago our ancestors obviously carved out of stone. But what is it for? What does it do? How do we use it? We don't know, but it looks like they took an awful lot of time to carve this stone into this very particular shape. And because we don't know what it's for or what it does, we'll just call it an implement until it's figured out. Um, and in a similar vein, a lot of a lot of knives that had very specific shapes and forms, um, sometimes they get the title of implement, sometimes they get ceremonial tacked on there when maybe it was ceremonial, maybe it was practical, but and no one feels like researching further or actually talking to the tribes that are still around. And so they just kind of move on with their lives and call it Lazy a archaeologists. Lazy archaeologists. <laughs> All right, so, so. Uh, back to the topic on hand. Uh, this is Clicks and Quesadillas. That's, that's my YouTube I quite like that. Thank that's you. Good. That's Thank a good you. channel name. Uh, <clears throat> we're here to talk about mostly hero clicks, but whatever else we come across. Um, this is Josh, and I'm Jason. Uh, Josh, at some point, I would like to have someone interview me. I Maybe. love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Man, fantastic. But I'm here to interview Josh today. Oh. Yes. Yeah! Hey! Welcome, Josh. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Hey, I'm glad to be at... Oh, it's your house. Oh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> cool. Great. So, um... Who taught you how to play Hero Clicks, huh? You did. What? Oh man! Have you? Did you ever hear about Hero Clicks before I brought it? I had. Your I had never heard of it. I had never seen it. I. It was. It was outside of my frame of reference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, do you have a favorite piece you've used before? Yes. Um, I would have to say that my favorite piece uh, is this killer croc that I got. Oh, oh yeah. Must have been. It was quite a while ago. Uh, yeah. About two years, yep. maybe. <clears throat> and During the No Man's Land LE prize stuff. And part of the reason why I like this killer croc so much, um, and I actually don't remember the specifics of his his name or series, other than the fact that it's Killer Croc wearing a white suit. Um, he does look dapper. He looks very dapper. Um, I think I just got it after a particularly fun night of, uh, of a clicks tournament at the local shop. And I think it was just one of the random roll-off prizes that I happened to win, but he, he's a really good piece, and I like things that are limited edition, and, I don't know, I have a lot of fun with that one. He's fun. Doesn't he have, like, some kind of, a uh, like, his blade's claws power? Like, you get to roll your damage, but, like, pick between you pick two the, dice? I believe so. You roll twice <clears throat> for his damage, and then just pick whichever one you like, and at one point, I, I believe he also has that in addition to Frenzy? Is that where you make multiple attacks. Oh yes, uh, Flurry. Flurry, oh, Flurry. Yeah. There are a couple clicks, uh, at least one, where he has Flurry and the Special Blades Claws, so you get to, you know, in theory, hit twice and pick your damage each time, which is pretty cool. That's nifty. Mm. Um, so Josh, uh, let's see, you you also play d and D. I I do, yes. Tell us a little bit about that. About D&D in general, or about my campaigns? Hmm... Um, just uh, very, very little bit about what D&D &D is, and mm -hmm. then mostly what I want to hear about, like, what are you doing? That's fair. So, so I recently um, heard a great description from, of D&D &D from a friend of mine who described it as being, like, manual video games, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. basically the whole idea is that um, most, most role-playing video games you can find now have, uh, especially those with, like, skill development and whatnot have some roots in D&D. &D. And basically, you create your hero according to certain parameters, and um, you pick his stats, and you pick his, uh, his backstory. You imagine what his or her life is all about, and then you play that character. And one player at the table, the dungeon master, creates creates the world that your hero travels through. He's like the narrator. The narrator. And you think of how your character would react to different situations, not necessarily how you would react, because you know a lot more about, you know, oh, there's probably a trap behind that door, or maybe this wizard is actually evil. But if your character would have no reason to know that, it's kind of fun to play the story through as your character would, and just kind of put yourself into a fictional being's shoes not only walk around in them, but sprint off into the sunset, bashing orcs as you go. It's good. It's good. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. <laughs> so, what are you doing? You're you're mm. the dungeon master, right? I am. For your thing right now. Okay. I am. Uh, so right now I'm running a couple thing. different campaigns. campaigns. I'm running a couple different campaigns. Um, one of them I just started more recently as well, and you are invited all the time. Uh, we play on Tuesday nights for this one, and then the other one's on Friday nights. Okay. Um, but basically, um, one campaign that I'm running right now is a zombie campaign. Um, it's basically all of the standard D&D &D fantasy tropes, um, except a zombie apocalypse is in the land now. And so, not only is there a swarm of goblins right outside the city, but a swarm of zombie goblins. Uh, is it a standard, like, Walking Dead type of zombie? Uh, pretty much. Um, in, in, in this setting, the zombies are sort of brought on by this almost eldritch entity, an ancient spirit that's kind of seeking vengeance on the land. But at the same time, um, he's aided by different necromancers all around the world. And so there are some slight local variations uh, every once in a while, there will be an incredibly smart undead, uh, still capable of using weapons and armor and spells, mm. and, um, well, I don't think my players have figured it out yet, but those are supposed to be, uh, Shh. don't tell them, uh, they're sort of supposed to represent 
the dedicated work of a single necromancer who has been here for a while. They're sort of footprints of where powerful necromancers have been. Oh. So I don't necessarily know if the players realize that they've been hanging out in necromancers' lairs this whole time. Um, Spoiler. Shh. And uh, the virus moves very quickly. About four hours after being bitten, you'll turn, uh, unless you have something called a scroll of enduring life. Uh, which may not be crafted by any mortal hands, but must be gotten from the spirits. Um, and wherever you are, there's probably a spirit nearby, and some of them are extremely kind and will give it to you for free, and some of them are very uh, malicious entities and will only give you the scroll if you give them something. Um, sometimes it's uh, lots of gold, sometimes it's an item that has deep personal significance to you, stuff like that. The other campaign is pirates. There's pirates. We run around sailing and um, escaping the authorities, but like, don't worry. It's 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 we're escaping an evil empire, and so we haven't done like evil malicious piracy. But if you would like, you know, you could be a malicious pirate. D and D has a pirate ship. <laughs> He's got a pirate ship. He's ready. <clears throat> um, so. <clears throat> I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Oh, well, I returned from... I remember now. It wasn't him, but it was actually me. I just returned from a trip to South Africa a couple days ago. Um, I, was, I was there on mission in, in Cape Town. Um, there's a little uh, unincorporated, unofficial settlement by the name of Seven Delon, which translates from Afrikaans to Seventh Avenue. Um, and I was doing some work with a group there called No Muck and uh, the Harger family, who uh, are good friends of mine who moved there full-time to do some work in the settlement. Very good. Um, uh, do you know anything of the language? I, I know only, only a little bit of Afrikaans. Um, I, I'm trying to learn, and it, it's pretty funny because a lot of the, the language is very similar to English, and then it just veers off at the last moment. So, like, the word for sunrise in Afrikaans is sun op koms. Um, the word for, <clears throat> pardon me, I got a little scratch in my throat. Uh, the word for, or the phrase, the music is a little too loud. My understanding is that in Afrikaans you would say that it's a bitty to hard. Um, stuff like that. English is one of the root languages of Afrikaans, but then Sometimes it just veers off into a very Flemish or, or even African route that I don't understand terribly well. But for a good friend, um, you usually refer to them with family terms. Um, so, Jason, you would be my brewer, my brother. Thank you. Yeah, anytime, brother. Um, this isn't your first time to Africa, right? That is correct. It's my, this was my third mission trip to Cape Town. Uh, it's going to be my, this was my first to Seven Delon. I did two others with a group called the Hope Africa Collective. Um, they were stationed about 15 minutes away. So uh, what the Hope Africa Collective does is that they, um, they help the people from the townships who have already matriculated, which is like the equivalent of high school. Um, and kind of help them with a nine-week life directions course, uh, teaching everything from how to use computers, English improvement, um, nutrition, budgeting, self-esteem, things like that. Um, they do classes on like handyman work or, or beautician work, things like that, and uh, kind of help the people who have a leg up to take full advantage of what they have available to them, and kind of break past the the entry level jobs you know if they if they want to if they want to own their own business uh hope africa collective helps teach them how to do that if they want to um Spend work time. in an office instead of you know uh sweeping floors for a dollar a day uh helps with that whereas the no muck team um helps on the other end of the spectrum the people who have nothing available to them and just kind of helps them get through the day no muck. No muck. Uh, explain, <clears throat> go on missions. Mm. What does that mean? So, so I'm a Christian, um, and, and so is my good brother Jason here. Um, and 
basically a lot of churches will send out um, groups of people uh, to go out into the world and spread the gospel, but of course the gospel is no good whatsoever if we're acting in selfish capacity or in a capacity that is uh, uh, not helpful to the world. You know, you can throw books at starving people, but chances are that the starving people would appreciate much more than the books. They would appreciate actual help. And so the goal of a mission trip is, or at least should be, um, in addition to spreading the gospel, um, also helping people, whether they want the gospel or not, you know, it's whether you help feed them is not dependent on whether they convert, um, but just being there to help feed them or to <clears throat> help do whatever it is that the locals want done, not necessarily what the Americans think should be done in the village, but, you know, actually asking the locals what they would like and uh, helping them. And while you do so, kind of demonstrating the selfless love that uh, Jesus had for us and, um, yeah, really, it's just loving people and asking them what they'd like and doing your best to provide so that. They shall know us by our love, right? That's right. <clears throat> um, well, that's all the questions I have for you. Oh. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, you know, I, I don't really have much else to say besides the fact that this guy really knows his hero clicks. I do. Um, yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's about it, Jason. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> How good it is to have friends like Jason. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. And thanks for coming to my house today for this interview, Jason. <laughs> Thank you, Josh.